Hello everyone and welcome back to Tier 4 of the F1 Iceberg. Yes, we return once again with more Knowing Wheel. And I'm joined by Jamie183 in a different room. How how are we doing, my friend? I'm good. I'm very, yeah, decent. I just uh, spent the first night in a bed for in about a week, which has been very helpful because... The absolute yeah. dog in you. <laughs> oh, sorry, in a bed, not your bed. Yes, well, in any bed. I've just been lying on the floor up until last night, so that's been good. Um, but we are here in a, in a brand new flat about what venue 16 or something i can't remember so yeah back for some more f1 iceberg i genuinely reckon at some point in the future we could do a tier list of all the places you <laughs> that's a great the idea podcast from and i reckon the one we did together would definitely be f tier oh top tier <laughs> especially when the, the uh, cleaner came in especially when the cleaner came in we love that um but yeah of course you know if you're new around here and you don't know what we're doing We've got an F1 iceberg. You know, we've we've been through all the basic stuff. You know, your rich energies, your 2021 Belgian Grand Prix, you know, your spy gates, that kind of thing. And last episode, it felt like we were getting more into the rumors and conspiracies, didn't it, Jamie? <laughs> yes. Um, you know, your, your Jaguar diamonds, your your lie gates, that kind of thing. And now we plunge. Hang on, into lie the gate wasn't a conspiracy. Of... That actually happened. <laughs> no, it didn't. Like it's a mystery, Jamie. Um, but today we are really jumping in to some even more obscure little bits and pieces. So, of course, you know, if you're new around here, please do make sure you give us a follow, of course, a little bit of housekeeping as well. If you're watching this on the Matt 2 and 2 channel and you like to watch, obviously, all of these podcasts, um, we have a Knowing Wheel channel uh, that is going to be the only place you can watch them here on YouTube as of 2024. Uh, and often the podcast actually goes out live a couple of hours early over there as well. Well, um, so yeah, we definitely recommend getting yourself subscribed over there. Uh, and of course, you know, all our other social media links will be down below as well. But Jamie, tier four then, where where do you want to kick this off? Well, I might as well start from the beginning. So I ask you this question you every do. time, just you so you do. say exactly the same thing. Um, so let's kick this off then, Jamie, with a bit of a cult hero <laughs> in Hans Heyer. Um, you said before we did this one that I was going to have to run through this, didn't you? Yes. Um, because it's a little bit confusing. Hans Heyer, funnily enough, I've only just learned now, still alive. Wow. Uh, was born on the 16th of March, 1943, so celebrated his 80th birthday earlier this year. I hope he is doing well. Now, you know, he was a uh, motorbike and cart rider uh, back in the early 60s, and of course, you know, was had high aspirations of Formula One. And he made his debut, Jamie, in the 1977 German Grand Prix. Well, unfortunately, he wasn't fast enough. He failed to qualify. Uh, so that is how he got DNQ'd from the race. However, as the lights went green at the Hockenheim ring, he sensed an opportunity to try and get back onto the track. <laughs> so he drove down the pit lane and went out onto the circuit, hoping that the FIA and the on-track marshals would not notice him. Uh, before he'd been... I think he was able to complete one. It might have been... He retired two, on lap nine. Sorry, no, nine mm. laps. Yes, nine laps he managed to make it into the Grand Prix uh, before the gearbox failed. That, therefore, gave him his DNF, uh, and then he was also disqualified from the same race. Hence why Hans Heyer is the only driver to DNQ, DNF, and DSQ all from one Grand Prix. A very special stat. It is amazing that, that no one noticed him racing until he stopped racing. Well, yeah, kind of a bit alarming, isn't it? But then again, Hockenheim had a bit of a history of people getting onto the circuit. Um, never forget the guy running down oh, yeah. one of the streets as well, wasn't it? Back in 2000. There's a lunatic on the circuit. Oh, um, that was Silverstone, wasn't it? No, that was Silverstone. Yeah, yeah Silverstone the year after. Hans Heyer is like the, uh, the opposite Marcus Winkelhock, basically. So he is the anti-Marcus Vickerhoff. Entered Hock, one race is... and did everything you don't want to do. Exactly, yeah. In the same way that Marcus Vinkelhock did most of what you don't want to do, he just also led a couple of laps. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Hans Heyer, though. A special place in Formula 1 history. Uh, Williams slash Brabham water tanks, Jamie. This is beyond, before my knowledge, so you can go again. Okay, <laughs> so... This was back in the early 80s. You know, they were trying to control, you know, how much underweight the cars were being at the end of a Grand Prix. Um, because effectively, of course, you know, they were having to put a lot of fuel in these cars. You know, sometimes it was upwards of, I think the limit was about 260 kilos of fuel. Now, to put that into perspective, modern Formula 1 cars are limited to, I think, 110 kilos yeah. of fuel. Um, and they're a lot bigger 
and a lot heavier. Um, and a lot faster, funnily enough. But Williams and Brabham basically decided, um, you know, to try and keep the minimum weight up. What they do, of course, is obviously the cars would be weighed before the Grand Prix. And they'd be weighed after the Grand Prix. But of course, there's no way of weighing them during a Grand Prix. I imagine people get quite upset if you got called into the weigh bridge <laughs> Mid during your second pit stop of a GP. So, what Williams and Brabham would do is they'd start the race, you know, perfectly within the weight requirements, but they would have water on the brakes. Oh, sorry, a water tank even. Often this would be used to cool the brakes during a Grand Prix. Um, so, of course, you know, a bit like if you've ever seen on, like, lorries and that kind of things, um, you, you the only thing you'd probably ever remember it from, Jamie, was Top Gear. <laughs> yes, yeah. um, James May's where, lorry in, in Burma. the trucks in Burma. Exactly. Um, but... What they then do is, on their final pit stop, they then absolutely fill these water tanks back up again. So they would again then be above the minimum weight requirement. Um, sometimes as well, this got to the extremities of Brabham, I think, at one point, were filling it with lead shot. <laughs> um, which is ridiculous, of course, very, very dense. So the, the cars during the Grand Prix would be ridiculously underweight for a period of time. Um, Quite clever. And obviously, really. yeah. Obviously, against, very, against, very against the rules, because Park Verme and that, but you know. I don't know if Park Fern existed. clever right enough there. that they got caught. Uh, kind of, not really. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was very difficult to police otherwise, of course. you know, He, he had actually got disqualified in the end uh, because it was considered as movable ballast, which I think is completely fair. And it's kind of a good catch-22, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, Williams and Brabham there, cheating since the early 80s. You love to <laughs> see it. Um, shall we get on to one then, Jamie, that you were going to do before we do the Feast yes, of Folk Award? Sure. Shall we talk about Alonso 2006 Monza Quali? Yes. Uh, this is like the height of the 2006 championship battle. You've kind of got, well, it's this titanic battle between Alonso and Schumacher. One of the, uh, yeah, F1 was kind of peaking at this kind of time because he had what, five years of Schumacher dominance. Alonso won quite easily. It was him and Raikkonen in 05 and then Alonso and Schumacher going at it. The two best drivers on the grid probably at that time. Um, and going to Monza, there's, I think, three races left after this, three or four races. Um, and gets on Saturday qualifying. Michael Schumacher puts it on pole position. Alonso qualifies fifth place originally. Um, but because it's Monza and because, you know, Ferrari kind of ran things back then and with the FIA, they kind of st still do if they were competitive. But um, <laughs> Ooh, controversial take. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, basically, uh, the team... Uh, Ferrari, this is, they had Felipe Massa doing his final run in Q3 just behind Fernando Alonso's Renault. Uh, when I say just behind, maybe like three or four seconds behind at Monza, which is mostly a straight line. Alonso is not on his fastest lap. He's not on a hot lap, but he doesn't have enough time to get around comfortably. So he's got to actually push quite hard on his out lap to get there in time to set his own lap. So after the session, uh, the F uh, Ferrari goes to the FIA and say, Alonso's blocked Massa. That's not on. Give him a penalty. Um, it You can kind of... They, they, there's an element of truth in that, but realistically, he's not really, it's not blocking. It's like... It's just uh, Massa's a few seconds behind Alonso the whole lap and probably gains quite a lot of slipstream because of that because obviously no DRS back then or anything like that. So, yeah. The FA are like, oh yeah, this is a good opportunity to screw Alonso over. Um, so, that's exactly what they do. And they give him... A, they basically disqualify Alonso's entire Q3 runs, his three fastest laps in Q3, without real good reason. Obviously, that's that's not what happens with blocking penalties anymore. Um, Ferrari, G. Yeah. Ferrari's the reason. Yeah, exactly. So basically, Alonso then qualifies 10th um, because they, they wipe out his entire Q3. Schumacher's on pole. And in the race, actually, Schumacher went on to win quite comfortably. And Alonso had his engine failure. So it was not a great weekend for Alonso and actually brought the championship down to two points after being 12 points before that race, which is like more than a race win back then. So, yeah, that really blew open the championship and Schumacher really should have gone on to win it if if his engine had worked in Japan. But well, <laughs> I'm not salty. Of course you're not. Of course you're not. <laughs> um, yeah, and of course, yeah, that obviously after that Grand Prix was when Schumacher announced he would be retiring from Formula 1 at the end it of the was. year, wasn't it? It was also uh, because Alonso, Ferrari were getting rid of him. That's not the case at all. That should be at the bottom of his iceberg it and we can just run about it. 
uh, Alonso also, uh, you might have seen a clip whenever Hamilton fans get annoyed at something on Twitter. There's a clip of Alonso saying, I no longer see uh, Formula One as a sport. <laughs> so, yeah, that was fun. Fun outcome of this race. Yes, very, very... It was a bit like the um, Juan Pablo Montoya Sepang penalty, wasn't yeah. it? Where you're there like... There's like a 5% chat you can understand why they did it. But 95% you're like, it's just Ferrari International yeah, Assistance. Completely. Once again. The FISA Folk War, Jamie. We mentioned this accidentally <laughs> last time. Uh, we, we, we did get it slightly wrong. On the eve, if I'm not mistaken, of the 1982 Formula One World Championship. Uh, the F... Uh, sorry, FISA even. Basically What is what? I don't know. So, I- what is FISA and what is FOCA? FISA was effectively the FIA. FOCA was effectively the GDPA back in the day. The drivers, It's yeah. probably the simplest terms, yeah, exactly. So it's the governing body versus the drivers. Uh, basically, FISA announced for the new super license requirement of your super license was directly tied to the team you started the season with. So it basically was not allowing drivers to switch teams throughout the entirety of the season. Of course, the drivers were there while going, well, if we don't get paid or, you know, something like that, we want to have the option to leave our teams. And obviously, FISA have turned around and gone, no, no, you can't, quite simply. Um, so, of course, you know, it was very much trying to, you know, sort of help, you know, your McLarens and your Ferraris, that kind of thing, you know, giving them power over their drivers, which, of course, you know, the drivers weren't happy with. You know, we very much made big steps forward in trying to reduce the amount of fatalities in the sport, not long up to then. Um, you know, with the ground effect cars and things like that. Um, so it was very, very much a time, you know, where the drivers were starting to appreciate their own worth a whole lot more, if you will. Um, you know, it, it was, you know, we kind of gone out of the era of Enzo Ferrari telling people not to be friends with racing drivers, they'll just get killed, <laughs> uh, that kind of thing. Um, and basically, obviously, you know, the, the, the FISA told them, you show up to the South African Grand Prix, um, you know, you, you sign these deals and you get on with it. And the drivers turned around and went, no. Yeah. So in a hotel in Johannesburg, uh, they basically barricaded themselves in. Um, it was up until I think it was on the Thursday it was announced. They None of them showed up to free, test, uh, free practice on Friday. And no one even knew if they were going to show up on Saturday either. Um, very, very famous, of course. I think it was Andre de Cesaris and Gilles Villeneuve entertained the rest of the drivers playing the piano wow. in this hotel um, lobby, which they basically booked out and just had mattresses strewn across the floor. Sounds great. Um, <laughs> in the end, the FIA did, ba- oh, sorry, FOCA, sorry, FISA even, did back down um, and remove this from the super license contracts, uh, but did fine all of the drivers anyway. Well, I've just seen actually on the on the Wikipedia page that Teo Fabi, one driver, was, was not going to do the strike. So he was thinking, no, he didn't, here's a race win. But he didn't know, apparently. Oh, so he just wasn't in the group was chat. The thing. He he did, basically, yeah. So I think he only got to the he only got into South Africa on Friday. So he just went straight and to no the circuit. Was was like, why is no one else here? Um, yeah, Teo Fabi as well, Jamie. A little fun fact for you. Uh, the most poles ever in Formula 1 without leading a lap. Took three wow. pole positions in his F1 career. Never led a lap. Wow, he must have had very bad starts. Very yeah. bad starts. But uh, it actually got, well, worse, apparently, in, in 1982, later in the season at San Marino. Uh, people were annoyed again at the FAA, or FOCA, sorry. No, FISA. FISA. Because yeah. they had, uh, yeah, they'd basically disqualified two, uh, the Renault and the Brabham's, sorry, the, the Brabham's and the Williams, because of water-cooled brakes, which is actually what we just spoke about, I think. It um, is, yeah. See, look at that for a close there time. There you go. So they disqualified those cars from the Brazilian Grand Prix one race before. And then most of the teams decided they weren't going to show up. They were going to boycott the San Marino Grand Prix because they weren't happy. Um, citing sponsor obligations. Uh, so actually, yeah, there were six cars. No, there was only 14 cars in the race in, when there used to be 28 cars that entered a weekend. So it was quite an ex- a successful boycott. And yeah, it was basically just a massive mess, so, <laughs> which I mean is quite similar to Formula One these days, really. But yeah, the eighties were quite Not a massive mess. Yeah, <laughs> Formula One has somehow built nearly seventy-five years of history being a massive mess. Yeah, yeah. So it's well worth a watch. It's probably a, a, a read. Sorry, the article or the Wikipedia page. I I wonder if the documentary. I hope there is. 
If not, we should make one. What, on the FISA for yeah. the war? We could. We, we might need a bit of a budget <laughs> for that, but we can do that. Um, I mean, like we've said, but we've said this so many times, haven't we? There's so many of these conspiracy videos or the conspiracy segments that we can't do justice inside a normal podcast. Mm. Um, you know, perhaps we need to do knowing conspiracy as well. <laughs> um, it's like a spin-off show in the future. Speaking of conspiracy, though, Jamie, <laughs> the Williams Spanish GP oh. tire conspiracy. You Go know what? On, I've I've us. banged this drum for years before even realizing it was on this tier list, on this uh, iceberg. Sorry. So you got the 2012 Spanish Grand Prix, won by the absolute cult hero, Pastor Maldonado. Um, he can be your teammate in F123. Wow, I didn't know that. He is apparently an icon. So Him, Kamui Kobayashi and Jamie Chadwick. Wow. <laughs> Kamui Kobayashi is tell? the only icon there. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's a bit harsh. But nonetheless, it's true. going into the Spanish Grand Prix in 2012, you've had four different teams win the first four races. With, uh, who was it? Button. Vettel, Raikkonen, Button. Not Raikkonen. No, Raikkonen didn't win until the end of the year. Uh, Button, Button, Alonso. Alonso and uh, Rosberg. Be- Rosberg and Vettel. you forgot wow, Rosberg. What a snake. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so you've got. And 2012 is a really, really open season. Everyone can see that. But going into Spanish Grand Prix, Barcelona is always a track that you have to have a good car for. It's That's where they test. Like, it is the track where the best car in the season often wins that race or at least does well in that race so going into spain uh yeah lewis hamilton puts it on pole position but runs out of fuel on his in lap so he gets disqualified uh, <laughs> william uh, sorry williams mclaren trying to screw him yeah. again 2012 the lost championship yeah one of them uh <laughs> but uh yeah and some very very surprisingly kind of out of nowhere uh pastor maldonado who has scored up to this point in his career i think seven points uh in in the year and a bit has has put it on second place on the qualifying and therefore when hamilton gets qualified is now on pole position it's like okay how did that happen who knows he then goes on to lose the lead to fernando alonso at the start uh in the ferrari before undercutting him in a second pit stop and genuinely winning this race very convincingly on pure pace and we're like what on earth's going on what williams haven't won a race since 2003 and suddenly they're like was it 03 or 05? It was 03, wasn't it? 03, um, yeah. So almost 10 years. And now they're just going to win this race where you need a really good car to win. And Maldonado is not exactly like, you know, Senna in a Tolman, for instance. <laughs> he's, yeah, his 2011 season was a pretty but big this was disaster, the thing, wasn't it? This was wasn't it? Maldonado, on occasions, was Senna <laughs> in a Tolman. <laughs> this is what's so bizarre. It was bizarre. very strange. But basically, after the race, obviously everyone's elated at Williams. They've won their first race in a long time. Uh, the the celebrations come grinding to a halt in a blaze of fire because the teammate of Maldonado, Bruno Senna, who uh, who weaved on Michael Schumacher and got taken out. Um, Sorry, <laughs> that's another time. Uh, yeah, his Bruno Senna's car just spontaneously combusts in the garage and destroys all evidence of both cars after the Spanish Grand Prix. So here we have. The car that they've won in, uh, they've obviously gone through the Parc Fermé under the podium bit and they've done the weight and everything. But before they can do any technical, uh, you know, investigations into the car. Tear down. Yeah. yeah. They've burned all of the evidence. And there are a few conspiracies as to whether, yeah, what on earth happened that weekend. Because Williams, they had a few more high points that year. Maldonado should have had a podium in Valencia and he probably could have had one in Singapore had he not broken down. But... He never got close to winning a race again, especially not on pure pace. And it was just bizarre that he was able to. And then very, very like a, a happy accident that all of the evidence was burned and thankfully no one was hurt. But yeah, there's a conspiracy that Pirelli gave them really cool tyres that were just way faster or didn't didn't wear as much for that one race. And then before the FIA could notice, they just burned it down. <laughs> But. Well, this was the other thing as part of that, wasn't it? And the reason why people believe this did happen, of course, um, was obviously the fact it was Frank Williams' 70th birthday yeah. that weekend. Um, yeah, so they could have been doing you know, a favor. So give, give old Frank a dub for his birthday. Yeah. Um, you know, don't know don't know quite what Pirelli saw in that for them. Yeah. But, I mean, it made a fantastic story, hasn't it? And we, we still talk about it to this very day. Exactly. 
Um, but as you said, you know, do, hand on heart, Jamie, do you believe there was something off with that car? Uh, I don't Go think on. deliberately right off. Right now? I think there may have been something that they did by accident and then realised after the race and then destroyed it. Fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. But I still think, you know, Maldonado was a bit of a bizarre driver, but... You know, when he when he was in the groove, he was rapid. You know, like we said, obviously Valencia could have got a podium. Singapore, you know, P two on the grid there. I mean, you know, that's a very very good test of a car as well. Um, you know, all three of those tracks, Valencia slightly less than the other two, but all three of those tracks were you know kind of middle to low speed, but a lot of quick fire corners. Yeah. Um, you know, which really apparently played into that Williams hands. Um, and I think, you know, the other thing about that weekend was, of course, the fact that Bruno Senna was just, you know, often was absolutely with Maldonado or usually had the better of him. Um, and that weekend was just nowhere near him as well, which I think plays into just Maldonado was a bit of a weirdo, to be <laughs> honest. You know, just such a bizarre driver. I mean, we could do a whole podcast on him, couldn't we? Yeah. You know, the cult hero himself. But yeah, a, a bizarre weekend. Let us know down in the comments below, um, you know, whether you think that Williams did cheat that Grand Prix. And if so, was it the tyres? You know, I've sometimes seen as well it was traction control. I mean, whether they had limited traction control in the car as well. Um, You just don't know, do you? Exactly. Part of what makes it great for an iceberg. (laughs) Let's get in then, Jamie, to option 13. A rather ominous looking option 13, isn't it? Um, Pretty simple, for those of you that know. Benetton. The year is 1994. Michael Schumacher has won the opening two Grand Prix of the season. Um, you know, Ayrton Senna uh, obviously took pole in Brazil. I uh, was trying to keep up with Michael Schumacher and span out of uh, Jung Sao, uh, his home Grand Prix, which I didn't actually realise until very recently, Jamie. Obviously, Senna stalled that car, obviously couldn't finish. Um, Schumacher actually won that Grand Prix by over a lap. Wow, he lapped everyone else. He lapped every single... I think it was Damon Hill and one other driver finished a lap down. Everyone else was two laps down. That doesn't really more. happen in the 90s that often, does it? No, exactly. Uh, apart from the fact the most dominant win of all time was also that season, uh, which was Damon Hill in... Oh, there might have been, the C, might have been a couple of years... No, that was 1996, yeah. wasn't it, where Damon Hill lapped everyone twice <laughs> at Adelaide. Wow. Um, but basically, of course, after Senna got taken out of the third race of the year... Um, at the track that I always forget. It was the Pacific Grand Prix, but I always like the real name of the circuit, and I cannot remember it off the top of my head. T.I. It's free con... What? T.I. Ida. It, it, was I, it was Aida, but it's not the name well, of the track the, nowadays. The T.I. circuit. Okayama. Okayama. That's the one. All I could think of was Mategi, and I knew it no. wasn't that. Brilliant little Japanese track. Never should have been a Formula 1 circuit, though. No. <laughs> um, Senna, of course, you know, had a bit of a bad start after taking his third pole of the year and still unable to score points. Um, got taken out by Ferrari down at Turn 1 uh, and decided to sit on the outside barrier of Turn 1. And he was adamant, adamant, that you could hear Benetton, the throttle, cutting out ever so slightly, you know, to insinuate traction control on the car. Um, obviously, you know, went to the FIA with it. Nothing was said just yet. Um, And kind of, of course, you know, got completely overshadowed, didn't it? By the fact that the very next race was obviously Imola 1994, Mm. uh, where obviously we lost the late great Ed Senna and, of course, Roman Ratzenberger as well. So it kind of then got pushed under the rug, you know, as Formula 1 really looked to try and push driver safety in a lot of other ways. However, a full teardown was done of Benetton, Williams and I believe Ferrari's cars, wasn't it? Because of course we'd just come out of the technology age and it was found inside the Benetton software that there was an option 13 that apparently Benetton still claim could not be altered by the team. You know, it it can only ever be altered by the driver anyway in the car, uh, but apparently Schumacher did not have access to that option 13 in the car. What makes this story even weirder was there was a thing, I don't know if you remember, Jamie, that came out a few years ago of apparently an old Renault slash Benetton employee uh, basically confirmed at like some business conference, you know, he was, you know, talking about Renault. I think it was before they were trying to transfer into becoming Alpine again, mm. um, you know, and it basically very much heavily implied that that Benetton was in fact running traction control. Uh, back in the 90s as well. But of course, you know, Schumacher was never done for it. Benetton were never done for it. However, 
I think the most damning piece of evidence of this all, Flavio Briatore was team boss. <laughs> so there was more than likely something suspect going on. Yes, probably, probably. He was always a bit of a slimy character, but uh... and he was part of the mob. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, I mean, Schumacher got a championship. Hill shouldn't have dive bombed him at uh, at the whatever corner it was in in Adelaide, did he? So there yep. you go. <laughs> Senna would have absolutely won that championship oh, yeah. if Hill could drag it out to the championship finale. Yeah, um, it says a lot that Schumacher yes. won the championship despite being disqualified from two races. That's a very Schumacher it thing does. to do. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, Jamie, option thirteen thoughts, feelings. Uh, that car was legal. Schumacher's the goat. Don't care. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, McLaren Harama DSQ, Jamie. I know nothing about this. Take it away. Okay. The eighties are not uh, my strong to do point. Element. The late 80s is not your strong point. It worries me, therefore, that it is mine. <laughs> so, it's not the 80s either. It's 1976. No, even worse. <laughs> so, James Hunt, he's had a bit of a, bit of a nightmare in the first two Grand Prix of the year, Jamie. Um, DNFs in the opening two of the first three Grand Prix, but bounced back for his first win in Harama at the Spanish Grand Prix. However... All is not as it seems. The car is then disqualified after the race for being half a centimetre too wide at the rear. Um, now, if, you know, if you've ever seen Rush before, um, you'll know that cars back in the 70s, the, the rear tyres, you know, the, the technology wasn't there. <laughs> uh, so they basically just had the mantra of girth is worth. Yes. <laughs> um, and the, re- the rear tyres on those cars were stupidly big. Um, however, yeah, McLaren argued that obviously due to it being the Spanish Grand Prix and obviously Spain in you know heading in towards the summer it was impossibly warm and the tyres obviously you know made from not particularly sophisticated rubber back then the tyres had basically expanded to such a point that obviously McLaren weren't expecting which had made them too wide uh, for the GP now of course you know this was still I mean it's Formula 1 the FIA, you know, they're, they're, they're working for Ferrari. It's pretty simple. Um, so, obviously, Ferrari were the ones that really pushed for this. Uh, however, two months later, uh, Hunt's win was, in fact, reinstated, which allowed, obviously, the 1976 championship. I do know about this, uh, to actually. go in the way of James Hunt. Have, is it because you've watched Yes, Russia? it is. <laughs> Thought so. Yeah, that was uh, so. quite mad, wasn't it? The FIA definitely were on Team Ferrari, Team Lauda that season. So, yeah. And without that, I think Hunt had basically got no points in the other first three races and that was he taken a few i think in one of them but yeah it basically the championship had not been the way it wanted to be yeah had he not had he got disqualified from spain uh was it spain yeah harama he would have got he would have had a, a second place and five non-points in the first six races yeah not not great no. if you, i mean let's be fair i think we've both said this before of course 1976 uh has absolutely been you know, not carried necessarily by Rush, but made a lot more famous by Rush. Yeah. I would argue still one of the most overhyped Formula One World <laughs> Championships of all time. Lauda should have absolutely like. It was don't a great get story. me wrong, James Hunt was an absolute character. Yeah, he didn't deserve a World but Championship. But Lauda was such a better driver. Yeah, yeah. Lauda was so far clear. Oh yeah, for sure. I um, mean, you know, should have won that title anyway. Um, but he got three, but so it's alright. That's not the way Formula One works. <laughs> You know, you, you, I'm sure many would argue the same with Kimi Raikkonen in 2007. No. Uh, well, um, Raikkonen deserved one. He just didn't deserve 07. It's the problem. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think he's always always the fun yeah. of Formula One. Shall we jump down then, Jamie, to... Rick- you know about yes. the Ricardo with Tracy Band, didn't Yeah, you? this is quite mad. Uh, I can't remember what year it was, but it was uh, Monza uh, in whatever year it was. I think it was the 80s. Um Ricardo Patrese. I was saying, it must have been early yeah. 80s. Um, Ricardo Patrese's qualified, I think, 12th. Uh, going into the the start of the race, the first lap, he's trying to overtake uh, somebody around the outside and uh, doesn't quite come off, but it wasn't really his fault. He was just like, people understood into him and a massive crash broke out um, that actually cost Warren Peterson his life, which is very sad. Um, and... Yeah, Ricardo Patrese, after the race, was absolutely thrown under the bus by all of his colleagues, basically. Um, and the Drivers Association, which was FOCA at that point, I think, uh, basically gave him a one-race ban, which obviously isn't what the what happens nowadays if someone, like the last time he saw it was Grosjean, of course, but 
the the fact that he got basically a peer review and they decide he should be banned for a race almost immediately after the race having like obviously it's super super raw they haven't looked at it properly haven't really looked at the replays that much they just decided it was crazy's fault uh, but he did actually miss the very next race because he was racing, like he was banned by his teammates and by his colleagues. Um, and then he came back, did the rest of the season, and then later on was uh, was proven that it wasn't his fault. So he got a peer ban <laughs> for one race and, uh, yeah, didn't actually deserve it. And uh, I think he might have been somewhere in championship contention that year, 1978. Everyone was in championship contention that year. Yeah, 1978. Wait, 78, sorry. Ah. Uh, no, he wasn't. He came 12th. Got one podium. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, he was. He didn't race in Watkins Glen because he was banned after Monza, which is very strange. Imagine nowadays if if the drivers could just like pack together and ban somebody from a race. <laughs> Pretty sure they'd be I doing think... that for Zandvoort, wouldn't they? They'd be doing that for Zandvoort. It'd be just every week for Stappen would be banned. Yeah. I think at the moment, try and make things interesting again. Um, Jamie, I want to save the, the big one that whenever we oh, show yeah. this tier list, everyone asks about. So we're going to jump in with the 1985 South African Grand Prix uh, before then. Um, I don't know about this. This one, of oh, course. I do. <laughs> so, yeah. Basically, you know, um, obviously South Africa, very, very famous uh, for obviously the apartheid that was still going on until the. It absolutely seems mad, doesn't it? Till the early 90s. Mm. The fact there was still segregation between blacks and whites in South Africa, uh, which is absolutely insane. Um, However, yeah, basically, obviously, what happened in 1985 was quite a few teams, of course, uh, just simply said, we're we're not racing. Um, You know, we we don't believe, obviously, what's going on, what's going on is right. Therefore, we will not be showing up. Um, However, only seven cars finished that race, last of which was Martin Brundle, Jamie. Um, Nigel Mansell won the Grand Prix so they, that weekend. How did they resolve that they were going to race then? Uh, I think they were told by the uh, by FISA or the FIA, whoever it was by then, um, that if they didn't race, they were going to be disqualified from the championship. Right. Because, of course, Bernie Eccleston loves his cash money. Yeah, well, it's a bit like Bahrain, uh, wasn't it, where he spoke about then. in one of the previous, I suppose, wasn't it? 2011 Bahrain Grand Prix, where, like, Bernie Eccleston yes, basically yeah. strangleholds the team. Uh, but uh, actually, well, it's a bit like always in Formula yeah. One, isn't it? Money conquers Although all. Bahrain did go the right way, thankfully, but uh, and they didn't race that weekend. But yeah, very very strange times. Uh, they didn't actually race again in South Africa until after the apartheid ended. After the apartheid, so yeah. that's all right. But I guess 1985 was yeah a bad time for the teams if yeah they were trying to not race and they were told to race. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was right at the end of the championship as well. Um, so you know, obviously getting disqualified was going to cost teams a huge amount of money um, and everything like that. But yeah, allowed Nigel Mansell uh, to snooker away a victory there as well, which, looking at it, I don't think really had any ramifications in terms of bigger picture uh, in the championship either way. But yeah, very, very uncomfortable situation for most of also, the drivers. You know, Alan in. Jones did boycott the race, actually, but under the yes. guise of being ill because yeah. Beatrice Foods, who was a sponsor uh, of Alan Jones, said... You're not going to race. So he, he woke up on Sunday morning with a very minor illness. Or maybe... Beatrice food spiked him. Yeah, maybe no illness at all. And he just didn't didn't go. So fair play, Alan Jones. We love Alan <laughs> Jones. Um, Jamie, the big one. Yeah. This is really what anyone's ever come to the podcast <laughs> for. And probably will get us demonetized on YouTube today and will cost me monies in the near future. Exactly. All the money. There's so much money. Two words... Be Jamie 183. Two of the weirdest words you'll ever hear back to back in a sentence. <laughs> Nazi orgy. Yes, the one we've been waiting for. Uh, yeah, so we've got Max Mosley, who's the president of the FIA, and it's the mid 2000s. Uh, and, you know, kind of around the time when all of the newspapers and journalists are just looking for anyone to drag through the mud. Uh, also, probably worth just noting very, very quickly, 60 years after the war ended. Yes, yes. A long time after the World War II finished. Um, but Max Mosley is pictured uh, by some some paparazzis at uh, basically a party, which is basically an, an orgy, a sex scandal. Um, and there's people 
in the background of this photo of Max Mosley wearing full-on Nazi uniform, like the uniform that Hitler's buddies would go around in in Nazi Germany, which is obviously very, very bad. Um, and News of the World put this on their front page, which it must be terrible to be Max Mosley at that point. Uh, but yeah, so News of the World, who is a big, like one of the biggest papers at the time, they've gone down now because they were doing even more dodgy stuff later on. But uh, yeah, you had Max Mosley pictured on the front page of one of the biggest papers uh, at an orgy with people dressed as Nazis in the background. Um, and as president of the FIA and a massive, uh, you know, organization, you're a very, very big public figure. That's not on. Globally yeah. as well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so not only is it uh, an affair for starters, it's also a hate crime. So <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, it wasn't wasn't the best day for Max Mosley, but then he kind of did have it coming. So, and obviously the Germans are all fuming because they don't like uh, people mocking them or their history. And yeah, it was just all round uh, a pretty bad time. I think Max Mosley did try and prosecute um, the news of the world, I think unsuccessfully. Um, Yeah, I'm pretty certain it was unsuccessful, wasn't it? Of course, you know, very, very, um, you know, it was huge news oh, yeah. for a long time, wasn't it? You know, it was one of the big news stories of that year. Um, of course, not helped by the fact uh, his father was actually a leading member and funder of, back in the 1930s and 40s, Britain's right-wing version of the Nazis yeah. extremist group as well. So, you know, he kind of been brought into that family yeah. And, you know, Max Mosley combined with all the absolutely bizarre and senile things uh, that Bernie Eccleston has said over the years, you know, backing uh, backing Putin, sorry, <laughs> um, you know, in all the controversy that he's always got himself into. Um, he, he, a lot of questions were raised, wasn't it, about, you know, who really was in control of Formula One at that point when you got Nazi and right-wing extremist, super, uh, you know, uh, sympathisers, sorry. Uh, was the word I'm looking for, but yeah, it basically spelt his end of it? being FIA president. Uh, yes, yeah. what which year was this again? This... Sorry, because I feel like this was, this was 2008 around so yeah, it was after Spygate as well, wasn't yeah. It? So, or as Spygate was coming, Spygate out. was also huge, and so was Crashgate. So, like, this was a really, really bad time for Formula One. Uh, luckily, 2009 made everyone happy because Jensen Button won the championship, so that was all right, but. Yeah, 07 08 was a mental time to be part of Formula One. Because I think this was one of the little tie ins, wasn't it, with Spygate? Was, of course, you know, I think it was Ron Dennis had been very vocal. Because obviously, Ron Dennis and Max Mosley did not get no, on. No. Like, they hated each other. You know, perhaps Max Mosley didn't like Ron because he wasn't an happy Nazi sympathizer. Yeah. Who knows? Um, but obviously, Ron Dennis had been very, very vocal up to that point about, you know, how on earth has this man still got any sort of control? Of course, you know, a lot of that because of self-interest and wanted to try and protect McLaren. And, of course, that was, you know, in turn part of the reason why McLaren were handed a, what was it, a hundred million, a hundred point five million dollar yeah. fine, wasn't it? Um, which Max Mosley was then quoted on saying, uh, the half million was for the infringement, the other hundred million was because Ron Dennis was a very, <laughs> very rude word, uh, which might involve... A letter that begins with C, um, <laughs> but just absolutely mad time, wasn't it? You know, you you had this Crashgate, Spygate, Formula One could have very easily been in the bin. Yeah, by well, the end of the twenty two thousands. Was it Theta Fo- No, the other one, Photo, the Photo War yeah. in 09 as well. So, yeah, crazy, crazy time. Actually, compared, to, I I didn't realize all of this happened within like two years. So. Yeah, nowadays, and this, all we have is controversial yeah. crashes. Like, that's, that's it, really. It's boring. Controversial crashes and borderline what teams believe are illegal cars. Isn't well, it? and maybe uh, kind of the... maybe slightly bending rules in 2021. But we move. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is mad when you sort of look back. Because obviously you had all this going on and still somehow in that time, five drivers from five teams won titles in a row. Yeah. Uh, which I'm pretty certain never happened before. Um, which is absolutely mad. Formula One since. never went through a more unpredictable period. Yeah. Um, and of course, and now it's gone through three of its most predictable eras ever. Yes. Um, <laughs> it was still so going through a very, very one. odd time. Perhaps perhaps we need um, more political controversy yeah. in the world of Formula One. Perhaps it makes I don't the see Chase Carey as. I mean, I know he's not here anymore, but 
the he's not the most controversial character, is he? We should just bring back like I don't know who is who's the rich energy guy, Will William Will Story, Story, who you claimed yeah. last time bought out. Well, if he was pre- FIA president, then you know that could have been quite controversial, and we'd quite. we'd get more stories like this. We would, yeah. Bernie Eccleston still went to get paid by the rich energy yeah. sponsorship money, but like has. Um, but Jamie, we, we've smashed through that, haven't we? Oh, yeah. Tier four of the F1 iceberg, and more and more controversy going on. I'm I'm looking at tier five ready for the next show, uh, which we don't quite know now when that'll be, because of course Formula One is back yes. uh, this weekend. Should we quickly do predictions uh, looking... for, for Zandvoort, by the way? Uh, are we gonna? Do... I thought we were gonna do a preview show. Uh... I thought we were gonna. I thought we were gonna treat we the could. viewers. Yeah, yeah, we'll try and fit one in. We'll we'll save one for either Thursday or Friday there to get all of our preview ready in uh, for the Dutch Grand Prix. But thank you all, as always, so much for listening. If you have enjoyed, please do make sure to leave a like, get yourself subscribed to, like we said, obviously the Norm Wheel YouTube channel uh, will be linked down below for obviously all of our YouTube listeners. Um, But yeah, we'll hopefully be back then for a second show this week. Uh, ready to preview the Dutch Grand Prix. Jamie, anything to add? I'm gonna I'm gonna let you round out the show. I'm gonna put you. Wow, on the what spot. am I gonna say? Uh, yeah, we look forward to the next time we do an iceberg. I'm I'm already seeing Foo in there, which should be quite fun. <laughs> it is gonna be spicy. Jamie, finish us out. What again? I don't know what to say. This is well, thanks for watching. Goodbye. <laughs>